Hello, everyone. Thank you for your patience. We'll get started here if everyone is ready. And we can Sorry. Um, so, we are here today to talk about our piece and the proposal process. Um, and so, I don't know the experience of folks here in the room. I'd like if anyone's open to saying where they're at in the RFP process for anyone to share so that I know um, kind of the, the audience are speaking with. Does anyone want to share what they do in the RFP world? That's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> That's a big piece of puzzle. That's all of it. Yes. Anyone else? Okay. <laughs> uh, just curious. So, are both of you one person in shops, or do you have a team that you work with on these, like, and you each hold your own? How do How do you do it? If you want to. Start? So we have a small, dedicated proposal team um, that kind of helps fill in some, you know, uh, reusable content. And then we, you know, I, my position, I kind of coordinate with the delivery team to get in more specific okay. types of content. And then I probably do a big chunk of heavy lifting on the price of this. Okay. Interesting. Anyone else on the show? Right. Well, because everybody wants to throw just their own little curve in, in, into it, right? So that, and that's exactly what we're talking about today. Our views are rough. So anyone that is in the industry knows our views are often great and many among the same sort of outline, and then many variations in between. Um, and the variations are part of what is helpful and hurtful in the RFP proposal process, and that's what we're going to talk a little bit about today. Um, so, I just want to make sure that it's a rendering. It is. Um, so this is a little bit of an overview of today's agenda, and sorry, that sounds really loud. Um, so we'll get through this and then we'll have time for questions. Um, but we'll go through a bit on all these different aspects and um, you know, how we can help our clients write our piece better, as well as how we can respond to ours. It's a little bit of an overview of what we have planned for today. Um, so I work with Comment Source. And uh, we're a full service agency. We do um, everything from your discovery and the audits all the way through to ongoing support, including accessibility support and uh, you know, things such as sorry, and things such as uh, uh, your basic maintenance as well. Um, so that is uh, who Promet identifies with a full spectrum of services. Um, we'll take you through from conceptualization to completion and then maintenance and support. And um, a couple of key considerations in the RFP process that we like to think about is uh, experience and expertise. And um, it's, it's very interesting. Um, often folks don't know who they're actually writing their RFPs for. 
they should want someone who is very reputable and uh, well known in the exact fields they're looking at. But we're talking to very audiences, right? So um, those of you who have been working with RFPs know that oftentimes you're working with someone who may be a purchasing agent and they don't know all of the questions to ask, for example, at times. And so you really want someone who has the wherewithal to, to ask for the demonstrated expertise in web technologies and to also know what technologies they're asking for. Um, you want someone in you know, this industry specifically, you want someone with a track record as well in serving the government. Um, so probably at least serve both the federal government as well as state and local agencies. Um, and that is, those are two of our primary um, ICPs. Um, this is relevant because once you get into um, the, the dynamics of an RFP, you really want someone who understands what applies to government, what applies to and their level of government as well. Um, so there, there are different dynamics that happen within different agencies. Um, they, references and reputation of our agency, and not just our agency, but agencies in general. Um, our customers should be looking for folks that have experience and have a track record of experience, right? So we should be speaking to an audience that is well versed in dealing with folks that have dynamic experience across the government sector if we're speaking to the government. Um, so that is something else that we want to be looking for. Um, it's a little interesting the difference right now like in speaking with your government. We have a lot more federal folks. Uh, I spoke a few weeks ago on a, the same topic myself at um, Drupal Camp Colorado. There wasn't as much of a government presence. And so the folks that were there were at, for lack of a better term, lower levels of government. And they don't already have as predefined roles as the federal government tends to have. I, the federal government has a lot of this outlined already. Um, but when we're speaking with folks and, and directing them towards our products, it's really helpful to um, kind of give them a starting guide as to what they might be wanting to look for. Um, and so you're, again, you're talking about things like long-term partnerships, you're talking about ongoing customization, security maintenance, um, all of these services that sometimes get a little bit swept under the rug that are important to all government agencies to have ongoing. Um, and then we developed a step-by-step a -step guide essentially for these reasons, because there are often agencies that need support and assistance in knowing how to develop RFPs so that we can respond intelligently. Um, so my role as the proposal lead is not only to source for RFPs, but then to respond in a manner that is effective. And so from that perspective, how can we help them write a better RFP so that we can respond in a more effective fashion? Um, and so that's what a lot of this is built around. And I'll have some, some takeaways at the end that you can scan a QR code and, and you can get some, some uh, uh, resources that we've developed. Um, but what we've 
have come up with is um, to identify the key stakeholders, which is a big piece of it, because then you know your audience. So if I know I'm speaking to a purchasing agent versus the IT director, those are two different audiences, and I would write the proposal two different ways. So that's really important, is letting the folks that will be responding know who's going to be evaluating your proposal so that we can speak to our audience in a manner that they'll understand it to me. And so that's really important. And then assigning roles and responsibilities is um, another big one. Um, and that kind of goes hand in hand. We always like to have a um, project coordinator uh, on both sides of the team. So we have a project manager on the permit side and we ask for a sponsor on the client side um, to be the primary contact because we need someone who will be able to be a decision maker. And that's often overlooked at the RFP stage. Um, and so one of the things we try to highlight right off the bat is who is your project sponsor, who will be responsible for making decisions, and who will be, would we be working with so that, again, we also, we can set schedules, we can know who we're talking to and what level the talks can have in terms of technology and all of that. Um, and then developing um, the project overview and requirements. The, the more detailed it can be, honestly, the better. Um, but the templates can be completely customizable, uh, but essentially there are key features that most organizations are looking for. And these are things that it's good to have pulled from um, for existing, for, for organizations that are, that are making their RFPs, and then add the additional details to that from there. Um, customize essentially the template and utilize the template as a tool for success. And that again helps with receiving better responses because the more information you can give the folks that are proposing, the more you're going to get back essentially. Um, defining the Expectations for accessibility, security, and compliance is another major issue. Um, we at Promet work with a certain, all, everything we do is a little bit accessibility to full accessibility standards. But if there's a particular security standard or something of that nature, and we need to know what that is so we can be prepared and set it up from the very beginning. Um, and there have been, you know, there might be a situation where someone doesn't realize that it needs a certain security standard and then we find out part way through, and whereas we could have already been working on it. Um, so the security standards are key as well. Um, the scoring criteria and evaluation. And um, this is a big one, and this is one that we have um, a resource on. We lack a really concise, across the board, scoring criteria from agency to agency. And so this is something that we have tried to promote as much as we can, is here are some of the things that we see most commonly, and here are some of the ways you might want to approach your scoring criteria, because the more the, the more consi consistent it can be from agency to agency, the more I can actually speak to you and tell you, here's how I'm going to meet this criteria. Um, so that's another one that we have on here. Um, alignment with project goals should typically go in hand with the scoring criteria, because obviously you're not being public goals, you're probably not going to score that well. Um, so 
so that it was part of that group. Um, sorry, I'm trying not to be long um, Market research and shortlisting, though. Um, so we ourselves conduct a good amount of market research on each product, and um, we encourage our clients to as well because they need to know what, who their competitors are, who their vendors' competitors are, and what they like. And so we encourage a lot of market research, um, both on our own internal side as well as on the part of the customer, to ensure that the the project is truly informed by a good review of what's currently available. Um, the more it's possible to select the vendors that you can invite to propose, um, the better. Um, when agencies are able to already kind of develop a shortlist at the very beginning and invite the selected vendors that they know are capable of providing the service, services that they're asking for, it'll benefit them in a few different ways. And one of them is Right now we're seeing about 40 responses, if not more, per proposal when it's just an open RFP. And that's a lot to go through. I mean, that, that's a lot of documentation. So if they can invite 15 people to propose instead of 40 or 50, I had someone tell me today that they proposed on um, a project that had over 100 vendors proposed. And we're going up against those kind of numbers. If they're able to initially select the vendors that they're inviting to propose, that might be, for certain agencies, a more beneficial option and a more time efficient option as well. Any questions so far? Sorry. Any questions so far? That question you asked around decision makers and projects and authors, and by the way, it's actually, you can ask it from an agency perspective. So the question is, do we get answers on whether or not we find out if, who the decision makers are? I would say about 50-50. So sometimes it's, oh, we're not answering that at this time. Um, Usually, the further along we are in the process, if we've already been part of the down selected group for the second phase, we'll get better answers. Um, at the very beginning, it's 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 pretty infrequent. Are you in the R? Do you work in the R and D world yourself? Um, uh, on the agency side, as well. Okay, so you probably know. It's fairly infrequent that the RFPs list who the stakeholders are. Occasionally they do. Um, but that's where I see the, the main shift is once we get selected for round two, essentially, and like for a pitch, that's where we'll see that we get a response on who the stakeholders are. Um, anyone else? Any other questions? Yeah. So you mentioned open RFPs. Are you seeing any kind of trends in specific um, government only doing it in the public and not having it within and if whether the trend or not, what tools do you do you use? How do you make sure you're That's a good question. So it's on whether like how much we're seeing open RFPs versus closed. Um, so we have seen a little bit of an uptick in more of the closed process. Um, I wouldn't say a ton, but a little bit. Um, the other place we see where it's a little bit more restricted is that you have certain, if you hold any contract vehicles, and so we have some contract vehicles, and those are a little bit more restricted. But it's still open to anyone that's on that contract. So like we have GSA, and DIR, and things of that nature. Um, and so those ones are slightly restricted, but they're still open to anyone that holds that contract. Um, but I would say recently I've seen a little bit more of the closed 
responses. And they also will not provide feedback. <laughs> So you're going to hand up over here, and then we're going to go. Where do you find the product to the middle of one spot, which is the area? Okay, so questions where do we find the art piece? In my organization, um, I have one individual that works with me that's a saint, um, and she helps. We go through uh, several different aggregators, and then also a lot of individual, like, like cities, counties, um, we register for a lot of updates as to who's putting the RFPs out. Um, the biggest one are the aggregators, and then I would say GSA as well, since we are on a, a, a multiple awards with so we'll GSA, and then um, Texas Department of Information Resources, like the DIR one I can reference. Uh, those are the, probably like the, the biggest ones that we tend to get things from. Um, and everyone who I think has their own preference on which aggregator they like the best. Um, we tend to find that uh, bit prime. I don't know if anyone who's familiar with bit prime. Um, but bit prime. They um, they seem to be fairly comprehensive, and they have recently, in the, I think it would have been in the last year, incorporated anything that's on stand.gov into their distribution as well. So all the notifications we get already at least have stand.gov, so that's now not another one we have to go to. We still have to do GSA for our MAS schedule separately, um, but for general open federal ones that aren't through a schedule, that's already on there. Um, so those are those are predominantly the ones we use, but then like I said, we have registrations with a lot of cities, states, schools, all different things that you know, say we did a proposal in the past, you have to register for the portal to be able to submit your proposal. Um, and so now we're on all of those as well. Um, so those are the predominant ones we use, and there's a ton of others, and I can talk to you after <laughs> if you want. But there's a ton of other resources too. Um, that's the one I'm going to use as comprehensive those you had a question? Um, not as much of a question, but about the invite, getting invited to a smaller list. You know, we try to respond to a lot of RFIs. Yes. Like, as part of the process sometimes. Yeah, just finding an RFI will get you invited. That's very true. It's very painstaking because, you know, it's the RFI stage. Um, you're saying, I don't know if I read her trying to respond to our guys before the, the our actual RFP or our case come out. And especially with federal government, that's where you're gonna get the most um, response from the clientele because if they don't see you at the beginning, they're not gonna they don't care at the end. So they wanna see the same people responding and the more you have partners and things that already work with those agencies better as well. Um, please keep asking questions as I go. I don't like to just stand and talk, so. Um, the evaluation and selection, though, as I was mentioning, we'll have a, we've come up with a template. Like, we analyzed over 100 RFPs and templatized uh, scoring criteria. And that's something I'll have here at the end. Um, but the review and scoring process, uh, we try to always get the feedback if we, whether we succeed or do not, we try to always get the feedback. And that's on our side, something we can do to improve our process. Um, but what's beneficial is when they can templatize it on their side so that if they have seven vendor or seven um, sorry evaluators, 
they can all be using the same template instead of just, oh, like, company A was great, company B was bad, you know. So having a template for them is helpful for them, but it also helps us learn because once we standardize it, then we have something to measure ourselves against in reference to our competition. Um, and then the contract negotiation and finalization can be a very, very much a bear of a process. Um, some of the, I mean, this kind of, I, I think part of it goes without saying that the more you can have contracts reviewed and analyzed, the better. Um, we've run into things where clients don't always realize what they're putting into the contract, and, and it just is worth the time to reflect mutually on what it is going into the contract. Um, even if you think, oh, it's fine to just use their standard form, take the time to review it. Um, that's a big thing from the vendor side. Um, but also, I mean, on the client side, take the time to review it because I'm asking you for an exception. What exception are you giving me? And so, this, the, the entire message here is that it's double-sided, right? So we want to have full conversation, an open conversation about what the contracting entails and make sure it benefits both parties adequately. Um, The best practices in home calls. I think we've touched on most of these already. And I'm sorry, I was just trying to put it in, so I'm going to stand up here. So I think the biggest things that I would put on are the common pitfalls is when there's ambiguity in the RFP. Your, how are you going to get a clear and concise response if the RFP is? not detailed and not, like, defined. Um, I don't know what you actually want. How do I know what to pitch to you? And that's one of the messages. That, I mean, that's not being it down, but that's giving you, like, the base version of how do, you, how do I know what you want if you don't tell me what you want, right? Um, and then the marketing research. I mentioned this earlier, is you know, there's often times where folks don't have a, a comp, like they don't have a vision for what they want their site to be. And while that is okay, it's again another ambiguous layer. You can always find an inspirational site, right? Even if it's like not that I want it to look exactly exactly like Tesla's website or some you know, whatever the case may be. But I like their face. You have to have a starting point. And it helps generate ideas. And so one of the things we found is during the discovery is to be very diligent on making sure that folks have an idea of what they like so that we know like kind of what they don't like based on that as well essentially and then the evaluation criteria i already talked about so where you guys are talking about again um but having a, a solid evaluation criteria is um, i think one of the most beneficial official things that, that you can do. Um, we've come across many, and, and as you all know, and we've discussed already, there are more and more proposals going out to the same RFPs than there were even just a few years ago for each one. And some of the evaluation 
criteria are very, very subjective. Um, the more objective it can be, the better it is for both the evaluator who can now just you know, assign a score instead of having it be some very long thing, but also for us as mentors that it's standardized and there's not this like open room for just any sort of judgment um, and no context around it. Um, so those are some of the major pitfalls. And um, I think we've touched on on all the other op uh, categories up there. Um, I would be curious if anyone has any other questions or yes. Is the winning proposal usually negative? Yes. So the question is if the winning proposal is usually negative at all. Um, on the close ones or not. Um, or it, it's actually up to the agency, but I find not to believe it's a close one. Um, on state, local, school, like higher ed, stuff like that, those ones are all going to be available. Sometimes you might have to do um, a FOIA request in order to get them. But you can actually get typically all the scoring documentation as well as all of the proposals given by competitors that if you do that. Do you have any tried and true methods to um, be incumbent? Tried and true methods to be an incumbent is the question. Um, not tried and true. So that one's tricky, and, and part of why it's tricky is because a lot of times they'll dance around whether we're going to commit or not, and you have to read between the lines. And so once you've been in it for a while, you learn the lingo and, and the, the way people talk. And if they're not willing to answer certain questions, or if they are, and make a judgment call as to whether there's an appointment. And then other times they'll say, here's our pain points with the opponent. This is what we don't like. And so in those cases, you've got an open door to say, here's how I can fix that for you. But in the cases where they dance around it, there's not really a tried and true method. It's more about just kind of learning to decipher the code of whether or not it's worth going for it. Because sometimes the other thing is that you might get in a situation where eventually you can tell that like they're just, they're only going to RFP because they have to. And they have to get X number of bids before they can reward it for the redesign to the incumbent, right? And so you just kind of start running the lingo, but when you know there's an incumbent, it's a little bit harder to decipher like, whether it's worth trying to fight that or not. The only thing I've seen that works best is undercutting them. But, I mean, you have to still maintain your own company's budget. So, that's the best option. Yeah, the, the response we've seen the most is, yes, there's an incumbent, but it's a good number of things going on. Yeah. Yeah, no, I'm sorry. I mean, there's, yes, it's an incumbent, but it's an incumbent, but it's an incumbent, but there's an incumbent. So, usually if they're the incumbent, they will tell you the pain points, and that they want to go a different direction, whereas, more often than not, if they're not willing to say that, they're probably going to still go with it. Is that my experience? Any other specific red flags or triggers that you see where that would make you guys go you get know, something? Why are you I mean, yeah, definitely. So the question: Any other um, red flags or no red flags? Um, so certain features. If there's like certain features. 
that some parents indicate that there may not be an incumbent, but they already know who they want. Um, we've been able to kind of identify some of those in advance just based on having done, like I said, your own market research, right? So um, we kept seeing certain things over and over again, and then you find, oh, this person has this product, that's what they're pointing to, essentially, without saying it directly. And so we're able to, to look at it that way. Um, but that's a little bit more individualized, I would say, than you have to kind of feel that one out. But the other items, of course, are going to be like budget, depending if you have something that you can your fiscal needs. Um, and then the red flags. Uh, I would say the, the only other red flag I have, like I said earlier, is really if it sounds like it's just going to bid for a renewal, really. Um, that's one of the biggest one for me personally is, is whether there's an incumbent or if it's just, and it's just so I would say that's the most frustrating process when they put it out there, but they've already decided. Yeah. You know, and they just need to have it out there so they can say that yeah. it's supposed to be right now. You notice like states do that. Yeah, all of them. <laughs> all of them. Yeah, and the same frustrating is that the, a lot of, of state um, and local will put something out just because they have to put it out to be able to say that they want to bid, but they already know that they're good enough. And so that's where I was saying earlier, that's where we've tried to learn to read between the lines. Like, if this company has been with this city for 10 years, they're probably going to just renew. And they were going to tell you in the QA that. Oh, it's an open bit. Anyone can anyone can But that's where we try to draw the lines to on um, essentially internally the evaluation process where do you go for that one and still be there? Because it takes your time, it takes your energy. So or is it better to go for this other one that they're they want to change? Thank you. 
but being able to get all of the story documentation is a big part of the 